Hello viewers and welcome to our report for round one of the Formula One 2017 Australian Grand Prix which took place last weekend and we're going to have a little chat about it again much like we did with the preview of the season. Of course I'm joined again today by Mr Tim Goodchild. G'day Alan. Um, we're going to be, uh, Tim thanks for your time again today. Like you say we're going to be talking all about F1. It's been an exciting build up to F1 this year. I'm looking forward to getting stuck in, seeing how these new regs affect the cars and seeing how the uh, season pans out. So Tim I guess to kick off then we had a lot of build up we talked about yeah. in our in our preview chat uh, and now we're you know we get to Australia, practice sessions. What have been your thoughts so far? Firstly, it was great to see Formula One return, um, to be on television, Sky Sports uh, doing a, another sterling job uh, with their with their coverage and their lineup, and it was just great to hear the, the sound of an F1 engine, whether you like this new sound or not, <laughs> well, it's no longer new anymore, is it really? This is now the fourth year of the, the but, hybrid but engine. They're getting incrementally louder, they are getting incrementally louder, I've noticed every and season. It's, but it's not a bad sound, it's just not the V8 scream no. or the V10 scream, is it? So no. we... We have to still put up with it, and even in the news this week, we have until 20, 2021, 20, 20, 20, yep. uh, the suspected new engines, what they were going to be, Verstappen mm. in the week saying that he wants the return of the V10. Well, I'm yeah, surprised we, because he, he, he grew up to his dad driving V10s. We, exactly, you know, I, I remember going to the Grand Prix and seeing the V10s, but they... I don't get me wrong, they were loud. It was actually more pleasant to watch the V8s, I felt, racing around. The V10s, when you had two or three cars, I literally felt like my ears were bleeding. They were that loud. It was almost uncomfortable. Yeah. I remember going to see them, and, and it was a physical sound. It wasn't, it was beyond loud. It literally echoed through your body. Uh, but either way, there was a, a sound of classic Formula One then. Uh, and like you say, let's let's see what Liberty do to bring that to bring that back again, you know. But that's four years away. Yeah. We're in 2017. It was yeah. round one in Australia. And it, in, in, in short, it was actually really great to see Ferrari back on the pace. And potentially, we've got an exciting year ahead. Yeah, I mean, it was great to see, you know, Ferrari on the pace and testing. Carrying that through to, uh, to uh, Melbourne in terms of, you know, overall speed. Competing there for the sessions. We had, obviously, the Mercedes out there quickest. But... You know, Ferrari was sandbagging a lot. You know, they really didn't want to show how much speed they had there, and and they were almost disappointed when they weren't topping the timesheets at first. So uh, it was, it's, and it, it seems that this car has been built around Vettel. He seems extremely comfortable in it, especially compared to Kimi Räikkönen. Even though Kimi put in the fastest lap at Barcelona just a few weeks earlier, so we sort of went one way or the other in practice sessions. Uh, you know, they, it was more a case of cars gradually building up their speed and. You know, I think everyone was being quite careful, uh, despite the fact that obviously Lance Stroll uh, went off into a wall and damaged his car. That was a bit unlucky for him. It was a very similar incident to what happened to Daniel Ricciardo, uh, that, that sometimes when the back end steps out a bit, fortunately for him, it happened right beside a wall. Uh, so that really sort of affected his weekend. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, in the practice, you, you also had uh, uh, Pascal Verlein uh, unable to... Uh, make the the race as well so uh, you know that was that was quite interesting what do you think of that Tim? So it was disappointing to see Verlein uh, pull out of the weekend following his uh, race of champions injury which is still going on but we did see uh, the was it the Ferrari academy driver uh, Givinazzi coming into the into the team for the weekend instead and a great performance that he put in. Amazing. Yeah. Um, but people have, have already commented saying he should be given a race drive for the remainder of the year. Completely disagree with that. It's Verline's drive. He had a race injury, and let's not forget that Verline's not a bad driver. Um, a, f a first race debut and a cracking debut by Giovinazzi. But it was just one race, and... He's put himself down on the map saying he deserves to be in Formula 1. So you could say, we could argue that if uh, Marcus Ericsson or Pascal Verlein mess it up or have a bad run through 2017, you could see a very quick replacement mm. go in. 
Well, Martin Brundle is always one of those people that he comes from an era where you'd crash your car, you'd be neither here nor there, then you'd run back, jump in another car, frankly. Uh, and, you know, I think there's even a, uh, there was even a, a quote or something, some sort of Johnny Herbert quote going around. I haven't verified, but, you know, about a driver not being up to it. Hold my beer, basically, you know, <laughs> if you're straight in there. But I can't imagine him saying that. Um, and you, you just think... I don't know. You have to be risk. You know, the reason why drivers don't want to let other drivers in there is precisely because of what happened. So we'll have to see. It is the health and safety that, that brigade, though. Isn't health it? and Come. safety. And if you didn't feel up to it, on the one hand, you know, you always have to say you're right that drivers shouldn't do it. Having said that, you know, this is these this is top end motorsport, and you know, uh, I think the reason he gave didn't feel like he couldn't drive the car. It was that he he didn't feel that he'd be able to maximise its potential which was different to feeling whether he could drive it or not. In that sense, he probably should have got behind the wheel and more experience. But either way, you know, he'll be back in China, and uh, he's he's certainly going to have to, uh, you know, demonstrate his, his speed against his versus his teammate, like, like you say. It's got to be Marcus mm. Ericsson. It has to. <laughs> got to be. It's it's. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. It's going to be interesting. They've, they've actually made an interesting battle out of this now. So, yeah, so the uh, back of the grid team. <laughs> yeah, but a, a fantastic performance there. You know, it's, as a stand-in driver to come in, or what was it, practice three, one practice session, no no testing hardly, straight into quali, beating your teammate and doing really well in the race Yeah, uh, in a car that is using last year's engine. You know, uh, what more can you say? Good job, chap. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. In contrast, uh, another rookie on the grid, Lance Stroll, yeah. not such a good weekend. No, I mean, he 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 seems he still seems a bit out of his, out of his depth to an extent, and you know, it took him a long time to build up the pace. His pace was a long way behind Felipe Massa. Uh, he had that accident, which to an extent was unlucky. It was the first time he was really pushing in that car. And he wasn't able to maximise his own potential. But certainly for Williams, for one Williams to be at the front end of the grid and the other Williams to be at the back of the grid, it, it was a disappointing first weekend for him. He's under some pressure this year. I mean, there's quite a lot of people have been quite vocal that they don't feel that, you know, they feel he's a pay driver. Uh, and he's he's got to set out to prove people wrong. He hasn't done that yet, but there's a long way to go in this season. I mean, he made the first corner quite interesting with his massive lock-up and to turn one but it's a great way to ruin a set of tyres and you find yourself in the pits at the end of the first lap. It's it's not going to be, you know, you don't win a race on the first corner. Um, it's, it, it's a Grand Prix for, it's an, it's an endurance really, isn't mm. it? So Yeah, I mean, it's all about, like you say, uh, experience. And he, like you say, he doesn't have that experience. I mean, they are new, faster cars, colder tyres, perhaps than he's used to going to turn one, perhaps they cooled more than he expected. But these are all things that he's got to learn very quickly and he needs to be on that within the next few races. So we'll see. He's under some pressure, uh, but we'll we'll see how he, he, uh, he, how he grows from that. So let's go on to the race. Sunday morning. Great to be up nice early. and early. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the first race of the season in Australia and all the cars lining up on the grid and we have an aborted start which is great, you know, so we get to see the cars go around once more. Meanwhile, we're looking, pleading that the local hero, Daniel Ricciardo, will make it onto the track as problems in his car uh, see him unable to take the grid. Such a shame, such a shame, you know, in front of his home Grand Prix, pushing so hard, uh, and of course the, the damage occurred, and it was, uh, uh, you know, he just wanted to, to, to prove something there, but... You know, like you say, the, in, in qualifying trim, the Red Bull was clearly a, a bit of a handful to drive and he wasn't able to maximise that. Quite a strange incident, though, because when you're going that fast into a corner, I was expecting there to be more load on the rear of the mm. car and he loses rear traction span off. And that's a similar thing that actually happened to Lance Stroll as uh, uh, rear end. I think we saw a few cars, look, what was a similar accident as well, was Jolian Palmer, uh, a similar accident during the weekend as well. So they were all accidents in medium to high speed sort of circumstances uh, where they were getting on the power and they, they just didn't get enough traction with the wheel spin. So it's it's quite interesting how the driver's got to have a better feel for it. But 
oh, you know, like you say, we're there just thinking, fix it, come on. Yeah, and I think it was uh, Raymond Grosjean or or Julian Palmer, I can't remember which drive it was over the weekend, that said that these cars, you don't have a second chance. You don't have a chance to correct a, a spin. You know, if you feel you're starting to go, you're going to end up in the, in the wall, which is great, you know, from, from, from a spectator point of view. It focuses the driver. You've got to push, but at the same time, if you lose it, you, mm. you're, you're going to hit trouble, which mm. is something which I think the sport has missed for the last 10 years almost. So perhaps when we go into races where there are, are big runoff areas, they will be able to save it somehow or they will just skid it to a stop, but in, interesting nonetheless. We come around for the second start. Lights go out and we're off and we see a great getaway from most of the grid really. Bear in mind that the starts are now... 100% controlled by the driver using hand clutches. So all this build up again, are we going to sort of see some drivers struggling with the starts? Mm. It's all fairly safe in, mm. in Australia. We'll mm. see how that changes. Pretty the straightforward. There was a there was a, a butt clenching moment for Jolian Palmer. I saw as he went past through two cars. Yes. It was quite quite narrow, but uh, that was quite interesting. And then of course we had contact at turn three between uh, Kevin Magnussen and Marcus Ericsson, which neither of those guys, uh, Kevin getting up on the inside, hitting a curb and bumping him a bit wide, so that knocked those two guys off the track. In many respects, standard sort of stuff for the first lap, but when you've got so few cars on the grid, you're thinking, <laughs> please no, let's, let's not lose any more of the field on the first lap. But generally, given the width of the cars and the power, it was all quite sensible. But I thought one thing that was quite interesting that does seem to have come through for the first race this year is that the stewards are not going to penalize or investigate every single incident that happens after the race you had Manisha Kautenborn um, CEO of, of Sauber say that she was disappointed that the Haas of Magnussen was not penalized following the the race incidents well i mean the thing is you, you have to say you know penalized for making a mistake i yeah. think that's the thing you know i i understand penalized if someone's intentionally done something that's against the rules but when somebody's made a little mistake and that's caused an error then that's an incident it's not a it's not an active uh, issue so uh, that's where manisha's wrong there in, absolutely in, in determine that and i hope that the, we will see a lot more pure fighting on track through the year so not everything should be analyzed you know if there if there's a, a driver makes a mistake and takes another driver out we'll deal with it on track at the next mm. race as the old boys did back in the day Ed and Senna and Alan Prost you know they sorted out on the track we want yeah, more, more common sense needed I think that's what we want you know we want guys to go for it we want guys to race and not always have a fear and if they make a mistake then you know things come of it, but it, it's you know we need to have the racing back again without without that getting in the way. So I am glad they didn't do anything about that. Yeah. So first lap, uh, we have the Ferrari squeezing in between the two marks as as they were on the grid, and Lewis Hamilton leading away with a very closely fought behind. Sebastian Vessel keeping him honest through the opening stint. Yeah, I mean, Vettel was really pushing Lewis. We heard Lewis on the radio sounding uh, not relaxed, shall we say. He, he sounded under pressure. He said uh, he was lacking grip right lack, from the off. Really. Right from the, well, he was moaning about stuff all the time. He was lacking grip and then he had loads of grip and all the rest of it. It was a bit, a bit of mixed messages coming from all the different drivers, actually. Yeah. But there was a couple of things Lewis mentioned. I can't remember the exact things now. There's a couple of occasions where he mentioned things. But, uh, yeah, he, he went into the pit first, uh, and then that basically gave Vettel a, an open track to race onto. Or we, we did see the development of the, the term, the overcut. I've never heard of this before. It was always the undercuts. So All the of undercut? a sudden, we've now got the overcut. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't understand. I mean, they, you know, this was a vital part of the race, and Lewis went into the pit and came out behind Max, whom he was never really going to have a chance of overtaking. They could see that before he went into the pits. Uh, Vettel wouldn't have got past Lewis because it was so hard to overtake anyway. Mm -hmm. So he might as well stayed out there until, yeah. until the gap was there. When Lewis pitted, he was a lot quick, quicker mm. on the new tyres than Vettel. Had Max not been in the way, yeah, Lewis absolutely. would have easily dominated the race. So I do think that 
to an extent, though Vettel was strong uh, and was, you know, still looking like the faster overall in terms of ultimate race distance. I think with track position, Lewis gave that track position away there. Uh, he must have been pretty frustrated about that at the time. And even Christian Horner after the race said that Sebastian Vettel should go and buy Max Verstappen a beer uh, because he probably wouldn't have won the race otherwise. Absolutely not, no. So that was the I mean that was the key thing of the whole race essentially was that was that one move. I mean I know that there's been some criticism over it not being lots of overtaking there, but it's I mean, Australia. It's Australia. I mean you know, there's less cars on the grid there weren't as many pit stops, and they count pit stop overtakes as well. There's only one instead of two pit stops. Uh, no safety cars. That's quite unusual for Australia. So, uh, you know, that was that was sort of the key, key move of the race then. And then after that, really, it was uh, uh, we had Kimi who had fallen off the pace some way back. Surprising Kimi's pace this weekend. It it was sort of yo-yoed. We had uh, Bottas, of course, who had a difficult first stint fell a bit behind with Kimi, but then really came back as the race progressed. And in fact, I actually thought towards the end of the race, he was the faster of the two Mercedes. Yeah. You know, it's quite quite possible the team told him to hold back there because uh, he didn't seem terribly pleased on the podium. No. Uh, so, but I mean, that was the sort of main action, really, in the race uh, was the sort of front battle. We saw Fernando Alonso... Uh, going around there, doing his own thing. Actually, do you know, 10th place Fernando was in, doing his bit. I thought, fantastic. While his teammate, I think, had an off at some point, was had an oil problem. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it was nice to see him still doing it so but there was, well. There was a wonderful best part of a lap of, you know, three cars. I think it was Alonso with... It was one of, it must Ocon. have been Hulkenberg yeah. and it was Ocon in, yeah. in the Force India. Yeah. A very colourful mm. <laughs> few corners with the orange, yellow and the pink. Yeah. Um, but it was great to see Alonso battling with 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 those guys. Um, really close, honest, great battling. And it was actually Alonso that said after the race that it was one of his best races of his life. Really? Yeah. You know, quite crazy to think that, but... I think it's going back to the fact that the cars are much more enjoyable for the drivers to, mm. to race in and it was close, honest battling and, and quite frankly if you're if you're a racing driver, yeah, sure they all want to be fighting for wins and podiums, but if you're in a tight battle with, with close competitors around you Let's be honest. It, that's that's what the rule. That's what gets the adrenaline going, doesn't it? Well, I think if you told Fernando just a few weeks ago that he'd be battling for tenth place, he'd yeah. have he'd have taken that with both hands. So uh, it was, you know, it's a shame ultimately that you know the, the car had some technical issues as well okay. at the end uh, again. Uh, but yeah, we, we, when we get to the next race preview, we'll, we'll moan more about that. So <laughs> we'll move on to him. So in the closing stages of the race. I mean, it says there were limited overtaking, but that's what you expect around Australia. The the battles to the grid seemed to be fairly settled, and as we came to the last few laps, we were kind of hoping that there would be a, a, a fight to the end between Hamilton and, and Vettel, but I think that's going to be saved for a later, a later race. They will come. We see uh, Vettel come home to take take the flag. And I think it's an emotional journey. I think that, that Vettel's been on. I mean, they, they were a winless twenty sixteen. Uh, last time they won was back in twenty fifteen, and it's a great. It's, it's I think it's good. It's a healthy result for Formula One. Last three years of domination by Mercedes. Mm. We come to the first race of the year after qualifying. I think we all thought, oh, God, here we go again. It's going to be another Mercedes yeah. year. But Mercedes lost. Oh, clear and simple. That yeah. they, they were the slower yeah. team of the weekend. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, certainly, I, I mean, I, I, I actually feel that they could have won that race comfortably. I feel they made a, a strategic errors, essentially, and that Ferrari took 
you know, took the open door. Vettel was really confident in that car. He looked really solid. Uh, he, he looked like someone who was definitely going to go for it. He was going to go for an overtake somewhere on yep. Lewis, and he'd have pushed them hard this weekend. Lewis didn't seem to have the legs on him at the end. He did seem to be out of grip. He did seem to be out of sorts. And I think that it was interesting to see just how close Valeteri was to Lewis at the end of the race. And I could tell there was a fire in him to, to mm. beat Lewis. And, and that's really great to see. So you know, he's not, you know, yes, Lewis has had a Finnish teammate before in Heike Kovalainen and many years ago. Man. This is a completely different teammate now who's uh, not going to be affected psychologically you know they said oh he's going to start affecting him when he's competing for the championship winning races it isn't going to affect him he's just going to be solid and he's just going to be pushing so certainly the competition is there it's good to see that Ferrari either way are on the pace I, th I think that the disappointing team of the weekend has to be Red Bull uh, we always expect a bit more but then Red Bull have never been great around that circuit it's never been their circuit uh, and uh, you know, and even back in the uh, Vettel Championship years, mm. they always seem to have a much better second half of the season. Mm. Out of the out of the park, you know, they've never, they've never been particularly strong from from race one. So no, and I, I don't think they are out of it this season. I think they can come good, but they've got a yeah. I mean, they've got these sort of away races and power circuits that they're going to struggle on. So it's making the best of a you know, bad situation. Once it gets to more twisty circuits, and uh, you know, uh, this, this is Adrian Newey. Adrian Newey makes the best cars in the world. He will work on that downforce and get it tuned just right. You may even see a car that's got quite a lot of changes on once they appear in China. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, again, they'll be struggling because they'll be using low downforce to try and maximise their speed. But it'll be interesting to see what uh, you know, advancements he can make to the car, and especially aware of the fact that seeing. You know, Daniel's spin off like that that there might be some way in which the downforce sort of cuts off a bit too harshly at the yeah. rear so it's a, it's always a balance between downforce and drag and they're always trying to find that balance but yeah they were disappointing this weekend you got obviously Williams who were you know done well with Felipe to an extent but Felipe I thought did very well let's be honest I think a lot of people always saw him as the weak pairing a week of the two between Massa and uh, about to be boss at us. Mm. Okay, he's you can't really compare Massa to Lance Stroll at the moment, and Felipe Massa is perhaps expected to be uh, the better of the two. But you know, coming home in sixth, starting in seventh, he did a really sterling job. You know, and yeah. Williams are look 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 like they've got a, a strong package this yeah, year. It's a solid car, and like you say, Stroll underperformed in that car, but. Uh, Felipe was sixth place. Didn't see him all day. I don't think yeah. on on the cameras. And he was the last car on the f on the first lap. Everyone else was lapped up to sixth place. Yeah. So the field spread is still very high. But there were obviously a number of DNFs. And I might be incorrect here. So, but uh, as far as I could see at the time, vast number of them were engine related. DNFs, so there is still a lot to work on there. Yep. Everyone's hoping those power units last, I tell you. Uh, I can <laughs> see that this season, quite a few teams are going to struggle in those last few races. Going to have to take care of those power units. Yeah, because we, we only had five power units last year because they creeped across into 21. 21 races. Well, and uh, where we really noticed it was in the practice sessions. They didn't want to come out for half the session. Mm. There's like, well, no point in running because we, you know, so... There is a, a feeling that perhaps they should have a separate power unit just for the practice sessions uh, so that they can actually yeah. come out for the, or maybe even a separate qualifying engine as well mm -hmm. so they can really go for it. Uh, whereas some teams might say, you know, we're just going to conserve the engine. I mean, a bit of a digression on, on, on the subject here, but I did roll my eyes in the last week when you had uh, Jean Tot, president of the FIA, you know, admit the most common sense or the most obvious statements that came out from his office is almost like he's just woken up to the world by saying Formula One's a little bit too reliable. It's been far too reliable for for ten, twelve years. You know, ever since it's been this push saying we need to have cars that must last X many races or gearboxes mm. that must last X many races. Well these guys aren't stupid, you know the manufacturers and all the 
or the engineers in Formula One, they know how to make a durable uh, part, a, a piece of technology mm. that will last a long period of time. Back in the day, you had the making parts that would last 200 miles. So you're going to get a much more high rate of you know, unreliability if you're only developing cars to last a short amount of time. So it's going to be a hard sell, I think, in a, in a world where we're trying to save money and uh, reduce the cost in Formula One to say, hey, we need to make the cars less reliable. Well, obviously, I mean, things are m were made by hand. Of course, there was always that. Now yeah. it's all computers and True. machines. So you're going to get that level of perfection. But what they need to do is, I mean, it, besides obviously other stuff to do the racing, I, you know, I, I was disappointed they removed refueling. I, mm. I thought the refueling affected the car weight so much in terms of balance at certain times of the race that y you, you brought in additional strategy. And then when you took that out, well, you only had the tires. So I, I think refueling is something, because refueling would force cars to stop two or three times when today they may only stop once yep. for one pit stop. And it brought in all kinds of issues. You know, there was all kinds of issues like Massa driving away and ripping the tube off. And I, I know it adds a bit of extra danger, but that's what it's all about in motor racing to an extent. You know, you they need to bring in more room for error in various yep. different ways. And, and like you said, you know, we've spoken about it in the past, even reducing the amount of ca mechanics per wheel to slow down the pit stops, uh, you know, you only have two mechanics on each wheel. I would love you know, to see something that. like that, just a reduction. Not even. To no, I, I like to see just one, one mechanic on one. Well, wheel. one mechanic on each wheel. I think yeah. would be even better because it would take it from a two-second pit stop to a twenty-second or a thirty-second, uh, and then they could work with the balance of the tires and yeah. you know have refueling everything. I mean, else. seeing a car come in and go within two point two seconds does absolutely nothing for me. You no. know, you've seen it once. It's great. You know, it is a wonderful. Yeah, almost like a you know a wonderful acrobatic act really seeing 17 18 people change you know f four tires and whatever else they need to do on the car in such a short period of time the blink of an eye but in terms of the overall spectacle you look at like IndyCar for example it is literally one guy you know, air gun in the wheel, take it off, put a new one on, air gun and back into do it up. That looks more, much more interesting. And I think you see, let's say you'll see a mm. lot of disparity between each team if you had a, a yeah. much juiced so, pit, pit crew. Yeah, let's wait and see. Liberty, I mean, Ross, Ross Braun's going to say yeah. his thing. So, no, for the Grand Prix then, overall, I mean, just looking back at it, and we've, we've spun off on a few different things <laughs> here, haven't we? But, you know, there's lots to talk about in that sense. Uh, <clears throat> I thought it was an interesting race. I personally found it quite an enjoyable race. Mm. I thought it went quite quickly. I've watched some Australian Grand Prix that have bored me to tears. <laughs> I've seen some where a lot of the field have, you know, fallen off the circuit and it's every, the field spread's been so high that no one's connected with anyone. There hasn't been as many overtakes. Uh, there won't be as many overtakes for Australia. I think it will be different once we come to China in a, in a yep. couple of weeks' time. We've got that long back straight. That's true. Uh, I think fundamentally the design of the cars this year means there won't be as much overtaking but for me personally seeing ferrari back up there is good uh i want to see i never thought I'd hear myself say that a few years ago but i really want to see red bull up there competing for wins as well and you know i think a word for the desperate situation at mclaren uh, you know, I want to see McLaren winning races yeah. again and see Fernando pulling out like that. From, I really wanted him just to get a point. Yeah. And he was in 10th place. I'm like, come on, Fernando, get that point. That would be amazing. Kind of but, feels like it's Arrows, Damien Hill, 1997 all over again, it, doesn't it? It does, it does. And I, I just want to see them turn that corner. Uh, they have a new engine, apparently. They, uh, Honda have Another finally, new I, engine. F Honda have identified the problem. You know, ah, I see the problem. That's the problem. There's no urgency there, is there? You know, <laughs> two months from now, we'll have a new engine and it's going to fix everything. Mm. You know, that's what they're saying. So, you know, it, it, it's just, that I guess it, it seems like there's no urgency with Honda. You know, it's, it's, there's no urgency. And now they're talking about selling other engines. I mean, there's been speculation that Sauber might want to buy a Honda engine as well yeah. once they sort it out. You know? I mean, I did hear one, see one report that. It was quite critical, and it came from Eric Boulier, that implied that the way the Japanese um, 
technology industry works that you work by deadlines but over a long period of time whereas in formula one there never really is a deadline it's it's just constant development you know you don't you don't sort of target to deliver something by you know november and then sort of wait until that point it's like well fine well we're going to do this by you know week two of february then week two of march you know mm. the constant development and that you just don't seem to be getting i, th- I think what it is that. is that sometimes they if different things require different aspects of the company yeah. to come together that they've not experienced in say the biking quite the same way and i think that shows the pace of development and the cost of development and from a logistical perspective there's a lot of organizational stuff they might be able to make changes on a bike much quicker in terms of weight and balance than when they make changes on the f1 car mm-hmm. you know such as having a fuel tank the wrong shape you know i just don't know how you even come to that in modern formula one you know what what are you thinking so there's a lot going on with them and i think fernando's patience has worn thin I and mean, there's even been a report mark Webber saying that he might not last the season there I, I don't. I doubt that. I, I doubt, doubt that. I think yeah. he's liking the racing too much exactly. to to want to leave. But I, I think all of this is about giving, lighting a fire under Honda essentially, and I saying, hope so. yeah, that let's hope they make the difference. Let's hope, let's hope they make a difference. We'll, 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 we'll complain we'll say, about know, them if if we can have four great teams, mm. you know, Ferrari, uh, McLaren, Mercedes, and Red Bull, you know, fighting for you know all the points, podiums race in race out that's a good championship then you always then hope that williams will be there to mm. to to do it as well but let's be honest you know you've still we've still got force india who mm. they finished fourth in the championship last year and they deserve their place to be there as well mm. seventh so, place uh, in in the race a good points on them yeah. and and i would just say as well toro rosso's eighth and ninth they had a, a poor practice um sorry uh build up in terms of testing mm. but uh, we said great looking car but it wasn't that quick but it turned out to be really solid both cars in the top 10 in qualifying yeah both cars in the top 10 at the end of the race good drivers good points uh carlos beating daniel um mm-hmm. good uh so uh <laughs> <laughs> so was no bias at all <laughs> no bias no i just i rate i just rate carlos more than i do daniel so it's good to see uh uh, him getting that and like you say I would like to see Carlos in a, in a, in a better team basically so driver of the weekend or top performer of the, of the weekend one thing I'll just remember is of course Esteban Ocon uh, getting 10th place on his debut as well Good, awesome. amazing uh, to see him get points uh, beating Nico Hulkenberg in the Renault which looked good from time to time uh, in, in sort of practice sessions but never really got it all together so. yeah so great, great to move on from that to bring in a feature that we're going to do in all of these podcasts um, around a top performer and bottom performer from each race weekend. And we're both in agreement that the top performer in Australia was the, the rookie, the one that had the least amount of, exp- amount of uh, testing experience going into the weekend. Antonio Giovinazzi, uh, the Ferrari Academy driver, drafted in as a replacement for Pascal Verlein at, at, at very short notice. Great performance. Really cannot fault his his overall delivery through the weekends. Uh, qualified well and raced well. Very, very solid first race in, in Formula 1. Excellent performance. I mean, qualifying was wow. This is amazing when he qualified. Everyone was expecting him to be three seconds behind his yeah. teammate. Uh, race, 12th, 12th place finish. It's a shame he didn't get a point. He deserved a point for that run. But either way, he's put him on the map. And, you know, if I was Sauber, I'd be saying, oh, I really want to see this guy do another, or yeah. do a full race weekend and see what he can do. Uh, he's, so he's, People are talking about him. You know, yeah. It was a good result for him. So, yeah. On the other side, though, we have to talk about the worst performer of the weekend, and it is the person that qualified 20th, and he retired in the race, and that is the new Williams driver, Lance Stroll. Really disappointing. Uh, He had good prep going into the weekend, and he just wasn't there all weekend, and he made some sloppy errors that just... Not not expected, really. No, no. I think I think it showed his 
I mean, yes, you could say, you know, Jolian Palmer didn't have a great weekend, but he was a bit unlucky. He had some technical problems with the car. Uh, he had the same problem with the rear end stepping out as, as Daniel. But, uh, you know, then, of course, he didn't have a setup on the car. So it wasn't a great weekend for Jolian. But in terms of Lance Stroll, his speed on track was never that great, not throughout the whole weekend. There was never, there was never a time when he was close to his teammate and he made a couple of mistakes in the race it, it he sort of watched him and said oh it's like first day at a new job uh he's he's got a lot to learn very quickly but yeah. uh, you know i think you know, these next few races he's like you say he's definitely under pressure but a, a disappointing it's not like he was magic in the car and you're like wow this guy's gonna win championships there was none of that but i i always like being proved wrong so let's yeah. let's see how he evolves absolutely Great. So, you know, a great first first weekend of Formula One in 2017. This weekend, we look forward to the Chinese Grand Prix in Shanghai, uh, a, a Herman Tilke circuit, which is not bad circuit from, from his, his, his array of, of circuits that have been developed over the years. It can, it can create some good racing. And, I, you know, I'd, I'd say a team that we haven't talked much about is he, just he's just Haas uh, team. Because I, I just, Roman, again, we, we haven't mentioned him because he's, again, another DNF. But they were doing very well, very strongly uh, throughout the weekend. It'd be interesting to see how they and some of the other teams perform. We've got this long straight at China. Yeah. It's a power circuit in that way. And we're going to see lots of overtaking down there. We, yeah. We're going to see the true power of the Mercedes versus the Ferrari. I think the Renault engine teams are really going to struggle. Uh, there's already the talk that McLaren are really, really, really going to struggle down <laughs> that straight. Uh, so they might be with everybody when they get to that corner and then suddenly they're not with everybody <laughs> anymore. So I think Fernando's going to have quite a lonely day. And that, I mean, that's even if the car can even finish the race. I mean, there's there's a lot of talk that the car again just won't finish the race again. So tricky one for them, but... This will be interesting. I, you know, if you said to me who's going to win the Chinese Grand Prix, I couldn't tell you right now because it is easier to overtake there down that straight, uh, and and there is some people feeling that the Ferrari power unit could it be as a, you know a total match for Mercedes. So, I think a challenging and exciting weekend is in store. I agree. I would put good money on that qualifying would go Mercedes way, and I think. Hamilton is going to rack up the pole positions this this season. Uh, I mean, in Australia, he got his 62nd pole position of his career. Uh, he's three away from Senna, on six away from on Michael. So I expect that record to be uh, achieved or probably smashed uh, yeah. this year. Um, in the race, I agree with Alan. I couldn't 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 put a a driver uh, that's standing out out from from just from just one race so far, we we will see. But I think it's going to be a good a good battle, and I hope it's a good battle, and I hope it's a close battle between uh, the the Mercedes and Ferrari drivers. Um, I expect I do expect the winner to be either Vettel or Hamilton. Yeah, it's good. Well, it's going to be one of the. I mean, it's it's pr pretty clear between them. I, I I'm just in, I'm just really interested to see how Bottas comes on again in this race mm. it's going to be easier to overtake here so it'll be interesting to see if his pace he's learned a lot in that first race and he can carry it through to the second race i think also the disparity between vettel and Kimi raikkonen in terms of pace uh, was quite high in the last yeah. race and i'm interested to see if Kimi can get it get it sorted out Kimi's one of those drivers we've talked about it he needs a car set up in a certain way to maximize his performance and perhaps the car has been designed around Sebastian yeah. at the moment, so it might take him some time to get into it. But either way, close between those first four, and then the rest of the field, it would just be interesting to see how the field spread works out. I always, always enjoyed the opening races to really a fun season because you there's always that, you don't, just don't quite know what's going to mm. happen. So, And I expect to see that in in Shanghai and I expect to see that again in Bahrain uh, in the next race and then we won't really know until we get into the European season um, until we know what the, the real pattern is and everyone will bring big updates for that race as well so it's always the exciting of the, of the openings, opening races of, of an F1 season and uh, I think this year has started off well I'm looking forward to this week's Grand Prix 
Brilliant, Tim. Well, thanks for your time today. And that's it for now, viewers. Uh, if you are interested in getting involved with us uh, doing Formula One, we're always looking for sort of new writers to help us out. And uh, those of you who are into Formula One want to join us on this podcast, uh, do do let us know. Contact us from the Contact Us form on the website. Uh, it'd be great to get more of you involved in what we're doing here. Uh, who knows where it can go. But uh, thanks for listening today. Of course, we'll be doing another podcast and improving upon this. Let us know what you would like to hear and some of the discussions you'd like to hear in the future podcasts as well. Uh, and hopefully, eventually, one day, I'll get them on iTunes and we are going to sort that out as well. But, uh, <laughs> but that's it from me for now, viewers and Tim. And there'll be more from us very soon. Welcome.